Uh, so Dr. Tim Rosinski is the professor of literacy education at Kent State University. He actually drove seven hours to be here with all of you today. So we're very grateful. And uh, he's, he's authored a number of professional learning books on the fluency of reading. And we will have him in our Scholastic store to sign some of those excellent books for you after his presentation. And um, he also spent time as an elementary and middle school teacher. So he has sat in uh, your seat and can relate to all the, the uh, challenges and exciting moments you all have in your career. So without further ado, Dr. Tim Rosinski. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. I was, uh, those of you who are here to hear the previous presentation, I'll tell you, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, uh, so uh, don't expect uh, n n anything nearly as good as that. Um, I, didn't, I didn't drive this morning. It was actually a couple days ago. I have a daughter who lives here in the city, and so this is a great excuse for my wife and I to come out and spend a couple days with, days with her. And Alex asked me to come out uh, two weeks ago, or, or having the teacher week two weeks ago. I, I would have had to say no, and the reason is because uh, I run a reading clinic at our university, Kent State. We work with kids who are having difficulty in reading, and, and, and we've been analyzing the data. You know, being in a clinical setting, you have to te test the kids before and after and see which kind of progress they made. I'm happy to tell you that our kids did remarkably well. In the six weeks we had them, they made between three to six months progress in reading. A couple of them made over a year's progress uh, in reading. And what did we do? Well, we worked on, oh, thanks. <laughs> well, actually, what we do is what you guys do. Uh, we've worked on those foundational skills with, with, uh, with students, uh, the fluency skills. And what happens is that comprehension, uh, well, follows right along. What I'd like to do is start with a fluency exercise. We start every day at our reading clinic with a fluency exercise. That's what I call it. Um, it's not really, it, well, it is. Yeah, it is, but it's more a song. I like to start with a song I like to sing, so I brought a song with me. I think this is a, a great song for a number of reasons. It's, uh, it's called The Garden Song. And it's a great, uh, you know, if those of you who are, have a garden going, I could have brought everybody a bag of tomatoes. My wife and I have so many tomatoes growing right now. Um, but um, it's also a great metaphor for, for teaching. When I think about uh, uh, teachers and, and schools, I think of them as gardens and gardeners. I know that there's some politicians that might like to, us to think of schools as factories and teachers as factory workers, but I think the best teachers I know are gardeners. We grow, we grow learners, we nurture the soil, we, and, 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 and the kids grow on their own, uh, almost, uh, uh, but we have to provide the guidance there. For those of you who don't know the song, I'll, 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 I'll sing the first verse to you, and then I'll ask you guys to join in. Uh, the, uh, the verses and the chorus are pretty much the same melody, so here's how it goes. <clears throat> la, 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 do we okay, here it goes. <laughs> inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. Gonna mulch it deep and low, gonna make it fertile ground. Inch by inch, row by row, please bless these seeds I sow. Please keep them safe below till the rain comes tumbling down. Okay, everybody join in with me. Plant your rows straight and long, season with a prayer and song. Mother Earth will make you strong if you give her loving care. Old crow watching from a tree, he's got his hungry eye on me. In my garden, I'm as free as that feathered thief up there. Okay, bring it on home. Inch by inch, row by row, gonna make this garden grow. Gonna mulch it deep and low, gonna make it fertile ground. Inch by inch, row by row, please bless these seeds I sow. Please keep them safe below till the rain comes tumbling down. Isn't that a great song? I think the beginning of the school year, what a wonderful song. Teach that one to your kids. If you're interested, you can find the, all you have to do is Google Garden Song, and you'll find the lyrics. There's actually five or six more verses to it. Um, and if you're, not, if you're still not familiar with the melody, just go on YouTube and search Garden Song, and you'll find about five, five or six different performers uh, performing it. My favorite is when uh, John Denver performs it on The Muppet Show uh, many years ago. Uh, not everybody likes gardening, though, I, I, I'll have to admit. You know, getting on your knees, pulling those weeds. So uh, Arlo Guthrie, 
for those of you who don't like to like gardening, he wrote the anti-garden song. So <laughs> this is just we want to be fair. Slug by slug and weed by weed, boy, this garden's got me teed. All the insects come to feed on my tomato plants. Sunburned faced and skinned up knees. The kitchen chalk with zucchinis. I'm shopping at the A&P's next time I get a chance. So <laughs> for those of you who are not, uh, don't like to garden, that's... Uh, uh, that, that, that's your song as well. Well, uh, I'd like to start, you know, still vacation time. We still have a few days left, and uh, this, this trip actually is a bit of a vacation. And I like to, you know, whenever I go different places, I try to find songs that sort of reflect uh, where we're at. So my wife and I, we actually, uh, was it Saturday night, we saw the Carol King musical. Wow, was that fabulous, if you haven't seen it or not. But I also like the old-fashioned ones, so... How about this one from Rogers and Hart uh, here about Manhattan? I'll take Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island too. It's lovely going through the zoo. It's very fancy on old Delancey Street, you know. The subway charms us so when balmy breezes flow to and fro. And tell me what street compares with Mott Street in July. Sweet push cars gently gliding by. The gray big city's a wondrous toy just made for a girl and boy. We'll turn Manhattan into an Isle of Joy. What a great song. 1929, how about that one? I, this is not the first time I performed that song in New York City. I performed it. Uh, I, I've been, Lucy Calkins has been asking, inviting me to speak at her literacy conference up the road at Teachers College. And well, uh, uh, ten, five years ago, 2010, four years ago, I was there in August and presenting, and we sang that song. It began my presentation. And, uh, you know, then we went on, talked about reading fluency and so on. Anyway, I got an email from a teacher the following April, April of 2011, from Becky Abasaki. Becky is a first grade teacher in Connecticut. And uh, this is what she wrote me. She said, I challenge myself to begin uh, singing with my students in October. We've been singing ever since. I've never seen so much progress in reading. All of my first graders are reading at grade level or higher, and they love to sing. She said, in my... Many years of teaching first grade, this is the first time that I found that to be true where, where every kid was on grade level. But you know, what, you, what are you doing when you sing a song, you have the words in front of you? You're reading. You're reading some of the very best material for developing fluency, word recognition, comprehension, vocabulary, whole ball of wax. A song is nothing more than a short, highly predictable, easy to learn text, needs to be read out loud, needs to be read repeatedly over and over again. I'm going to talk about those issues in just a second here. But anyways, I wrote back to Becky after this email. I said, Becky, I didn't know you were doing this. Well, next year, do it, and we'll actually collect the data, and we'll write it up as a study uh, that other teachers can learn about. And she's okay. Uh, and so the second year, she had more kids in the second year, first graders. Uh, what she does is she teaches her kids two or three of these old-fashioned songs, you know. And, at the, uh, and on Fridays, they have a hootenanny or a sing-along uh, there. Always with the words in front of the kids. Always prompt them to make sure you look at the words, uh, even if you know the song by heart. Well, the second year, she got very similar results. In fact, even better in some cases. So we ended up write, writing that up as a study. Let's bring that back, the magic of song for the teaching of reading uh, there. It's on the, from the reading teacher, and I was asking Alex, how can I get all these articles that I'm going to be mentioning to you guys? And she said, she has your email address, so what I'll do is I'll send you these articles to Alex, and she'll get them out to you if you'd like to follow up. It's a, kind of a way of kind of keep going, to keep the spirit going here. But we really do. We teach our kids in our reading clinic poetry and song. And, and think about it, how easy it is to learn a song or a poem. You know, it's something that our struggling readers can feel successful at. Our kids learn a poem or a song every single day, and they can read it well. How many times do kids leave schools working? Teachers work hard, kids work hard, but they say to themselves, I'm not sure how much I learned today. In our reading clinic, kids leave every day, and they can go up to their moms and dads and say, listen, let me read this poem. Listen to me sing this song, Dad, uh, and so on. My wife and I, uh, my mom passed away a couple years ago, and she lived with us for uh, several years prior to her death, and she had Alzheimer's. And so the last few months, we couldn't care for her the way we'd like. So we, we, we got her into an, uh, a retirement village or a, a, a nursing home. And the care that they took of her care was just fan, fa fabulous. So uh, even though she passed away a few months after that, my wife and I continued to go to this uh, nursing home. 
What we do is we spend an hour, hour and a half, two hours every Friday, Saturday or Sunday. Most of the time we just sit around and chat with these folks. Many of them don't have visitors anymore. Uh, but we always end our visit with a little sing-along. I bring in you know, my harmonic or guitar and we do the old-fashioned songs right uh, there. And here's what I find amazing. These folks, they don't remember us from one week to the next. It's like, who are they? Where are they come from? But you know what? They know all the songs. Every week I try to bring in a new one to fool them. You know, they don't sit under the apple tree. with any, Oh, I know that one. Now let's think about that for a second. We're talking about people with memory problems who can remember the lyrics to songs. Oh, now let's think about that. Let's put it back into school. What's a sight word? One of our goals in teaching reading is development of sight word vocabulary. A sight word is nothing more than a memorized word by sight and sound. I say put those words to rhythm, to rhyme, to melody. You're going to remember them forever. Even Alzheimer's is going to have a hard time erasing from your memory. It's interesting how we, sometimes we come to those insights here. I got into fluency myself as a teacher. I uh, got, out, was, got out of the service in the early 1970s, and I used the GI Bill to become a teacher. And I started in Omaha, Nebraska, first as a classroom teacher, but then I got into Title I, working with kids who were having difficulty. And, well... I, I, I was working with these kids that I, I just couldn't seem to budge off the dime. I was doing everything the book said to do with them, you know, comprehension, word recognition, phonics, and so on, but they weren't making any progress nearly as much as I'd hoped. Well, I was working on my master's degree at the time, and uh, the professors had us reading some of these articles that were just becoming, coming out on reading fluency. One of them was called After Decoding, Then What? You know, after you teach them all about decoding, but they're still not making any progress, then what do you do? The answer is fluency. Another one was called The Method of Repeated Readings by Dr. Jay Samuels. I'll tell, tell you more about that in a, in a second or so. But anyways, I tried to try these things out, and lo and behold, these children who previously were just flatlining began to take off, and in some cases, it was spectacular, breathtaking. So I got on that fluency bang, bandwagon 30-some years ago, maybe close to 40. And I'm here, I've been on it ever since. I'm here to say if you're working with struggling readers. Is anybody here not working with struggling readers in one form or another? <laughs> Take a look at flow. I mean, it's not the answer to every kid's problems, of course not. But it's an answer to a lot of kids' problems uh, uh, there. But, you know, despite the fact that I got interested in it, it's never really been all that hot a topic for a long time. Dick Allington wrote the piece, Fluency, the Neglected Goal, the Reading Program, and that was back in the early 1980s. It was neglected. It finally was the National Reading Panel. If you remember, in 2000, Congress put together a group of experts, and their job was to look at all the, all the research on reading and literacy development and, and tell us what actually works. And finally, this report in 2000 said, listen, there's enough evidence to, about fluency that, that uh, we need to be t uh, teaching it. And so when Reading First came out, President Bush's initiative, you know, that was one of those pillars that we had to, had to, had to follow. Every day, teach fluency to our kids. But what happened was, as fluency has evolved over the last 12 or so years, it got to be associated with speed reading, you know, getting kids to read fast so they can get good scores on the Dibbles test or the Ames web test, whatever you might be using. And it's only oral reading, you know, for, we're interested in silent reading. And then it became, you know, well, uh, it's only for primary grade kids. Well, uh, and because of that, it became neglected. Take a look at this. The International Reading Association, every year, they, they do this survey of, of experts. What are the hot topics in reading? And, I, and, and back in 2009, when they did this uh, survey, uh, all these experts said it's not hot, not a hot topic at all, because of those things, speed, primary grades, oral reading. 2010, not hot. 2011, not hot. 2012, not hot. 2013, not hot. Makes me wonder why Alex even invited me here if it's not a hot topic. Or... <laughs> not only did these experts say it's not hot, they said it shouldn't be hot. And I think that's the reason was this emphasis on speed and that sort of thing. I think it's comprehension. Anyways, I got a little pissed off. Excuse my language. Uh, uh, anyway, I got a little ticked off, and I ended up writing this article, Why Reading Fluency Should Be Hot. And that's another one I'll be sending to Alex and getting out to you if, you, if you'd like to follow up today's topic. But, you know, we're, we're now in the age of the Common Core. Fluency is all over the Common Core. Uh, uh, their grades one through five. Notice that I highlighted the word poetry up there as well. They're talking about bringing poetry and song. You know, song and poetry to me are much the same thing. Bringing those back in the classroom because those have been gone for so long. But it's not just grades one through five. We've recently been doing research with high school kids and we're finding that fluency is an issue with these guys as well. We did a study in Louisville, Kentucky, a high school there. 
ninth and 10th and 11th graders, we found that it was highly associated fluency with comprehension, well, silent reading comprehension, and that there were significant numbers of students who were, had not achieved even a minimal level of fluency. So for those of you who might be in grade six and beyond, this is an issue I think you need to be aware of as well. In an ideal world, you know, we, we shouldn't have to worry about fluency beyond, say, fourth or fifth grade, but the fact of the matter is, you know, it is an issue. Uh, it, is, it is an issue. I'm going to start by sharing with you this model of reading that I came up with here. I, I, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see that line there. That line there at the, about two-thirds of the way down the page, that's the work of Noam Chomsky, I like to say. Chomsky's transformational generative grammar back in the early 60s. He said that language, and he was talking about speech, had two structures to it, a surface structure and a deep structure. What he meant by that was the surface structure language is the mechanics of speech. It's the sounds I'm making right now by moving my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords, my diaphragm. The deep structure is what you're doing with those sounds. You're running them through your brain, you're turning them into meaning. Meaning is the deep structure. That's a very simple idea, but it's actually quite profound. Let's apply that to reading, written language. Is there a surface structure? Yeah, it's the mechanics of reading. It's not just the sounds you make when you read orally, it's the print that represents the sounds. And the deep structure? Well, comprehension, meaning. Now, what's the most important part of reading? Uh, grant you, it's comprehension. We want students to understand what they read. But in order to get dive deep into meaning, guess what? Students have to break through that line. They have to break through that surface structure. And for some of our students, that's not a line. It's a barrier that keeps them going deep here. So what we have to do is we have to work on this stuff above the line. That's what I call fluency, the mechanics of reading. Certainly words, we have to teach kids about words. You know, there was a time when we, we didn't have to worry about words, or at least we weren't, didn't have to think about teaching it. Uh, there, I, do any of you remember the whole language days? You know, I, I consider myself a whole language person, but not to the extent of some of my colleagues who would say, all you have to do is immerse children in this wonderful literature in every classroom. They'll pick it up on their own, much like they pick up oral language. And I will admit, lots of kids do. But not everyone, not every kid. Most kids don't. Let's teach, just teach them about words. Is there a best way of teaching kids about words? No, there's not a best way. But I'll, I'll, I'll share, with two, share with you two, two that I've, I've been working on. My previous speaker talked about game. We live in a game, uh, in, an age of games. Well, I developed a game called Word Ladders. Do anybody here do Word Ladders have any Word Ladders? No. Okay, so at the end of the session, go up to the Scholastic store. There'll be a whole bunch of Word Ladder books up there, and I will sign them for you. It's a game that... Um, listen, I'm throwing a little commercial every so often. Never hurts, does it? <laughs> it's a game that I got, I got onto by being sick about a dozen years ago. I had the stomach flu for a week. I'm, I couldn't shake it. I'm stuck at home, nothing to do. I started watching T got on the game show channel on TV, and I started watching this game called Lingo. If you ever watch Lingo, you've done a word that I got hooked on it. I'm starting to think about words and what they mean, you know, how they're spelled. And I said, kids need to do this. And so uh, I start doing it myself. And I got to admit, I'm really good at this. You guys might want to write this one down here, okay? Here's the, here's the game. We're going to start with the word work. We heard our last speaker talk about teaching being hard work, and it abs absolutely is. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make a series or a ladder of words, adding, subtracting, rearranging uh, the, the, uh, the letters the, the, from the previous word, okay? So change one letter in work now and make a word that it is meat that comes from a pig or a hog. That would be a pork, Okay. Now, change a letter in pork and make a word that is a green space uh, for, uh, well, the great New York City is a great big central park. Good. Subtract a letter from park and make a, a golf term. When you do things with the right number of strokes, uh, that's uh, par. Change a letter in, in par now and make another word for an automobile. That's a car. Ch uh, add a letter to car now and make a word that describes when you, when you accidentally cut yourself and it heals. Sometimes you might end up with a scarf. Okay, change a letter in scar now and make a, make a, change a letter and make a word when somebody uh, uh, finagles and bamboozles you, you say you, uh, you, you have been in a scam. Sometimes it's kind of hard to think of the actual definitions here. Uh, change a letter in scam now and make a word that describes when you shut a door very hard, that's slam it. Okay, might talk about multiple meanings of the word slam. We're not going to have any slamming in our room this year. Um, change a letter in slam now and make a mollusk that we make uh, Manhattan blank or uh, chowder, okay, clam, right? Okay, now here's the hard one. You gotta add two letters to clam and make a word that describes, I don't care, you can be the best teacher in the world, but every once in a while your class gets in an uproar out of hand. Another word for that uproar is what? Add two letters to clam at the end. Clamor, very good, that word goes on the word wall. Here's the last word. 
take the C away from clamor and change the M to another letter and make another word for work. Labor, labor, work to labor. What's the first Monday in September? Labor Day. Okay, so it could be that. See, I thought I'd impress you with that. What I do is I, I give myself two words to go together, and I try to go from one word to the next. And I'm really good at it. You can email me two words, uh, and within 48 hours, I'll make a word ladder for you. I am that good. God gives everybody a gift. My gift are word ladders, so i got to go with it here. Uh, uh, there. By the way, that's what the books look like. Uh, maybe you have them and you didn't know I was the word ladder guy. Uh, there, there's a new one out for, it's a phonics word ladders. Uh, it's the red book uh, there. But I want to try mention something else here. You know, we often talk about word families and teaching words, you know, like ing says ing and it can help you with sting and sling and swing and so on. But there's another set of word, word families. These are what we call derivations, uh, Latin and Greek in particular. The word that, and the, the idea behind these word families is that they have meaning to them. Uh, they not only help you with pronunciation, but with meaning. So if you know, for example, that the labor means work, then work that is very hard is called laborious. Well, let's see if we can figure out any other words there. Where does a scientist work? Laboratory. When you work with another person, you collaborate. Co means with. How about when you work beyond normal expectations? I know teachers always do that. They work beyond what normally is expected. Another word for saying it is we elaborate. We go into elaborate detail with our lesson plans there. Listen, I don't want to belabor the point, but oh, belabor, how about that? There was an article just in the Washington Post last week about bringing these, uh, uh, these Latin and Greek roots into the classroom. I took four years of Latin in high school. And although I thought it was the most worthless class I ever took, because nobody speaks it anymore, when I went to college, it became the most valuable class I ever took because all the, all the words I was encountering in science and social sciences, mathematics, 90% of them came out of Latin and Greek there. Uh, so really, it can be a game changer, as this author of the uh, article in the Washington Post says uh, there. I wrote an article on this one, too. It's called The Latin-Greek Connection, Building Vocabulary Through Morphological Study. We're teaching this all the way down to the primary grades uh, uh, there. And I think uh, I, it really, it, kids, are, our brains are pattern detectors. We ought to take advantage of that with our students. So we do need to teach our kids about words, and we can do so in playful ways, playful ga way uh, uh, there. And, and these word ladders and the Latin Greek roots are, are two. But what I'd like to focus on with you guys today is this fluency thing. Some people have called fluency the neglect to go the reading program, but other people have called it the bridge. And I like that metaphor. It's a bridge. It's a link between words up there and comprehension down there. Most of our normal achieving kids, they develop this bridge on their own. But our struggling readers, they need our help. They need our help, and we're going to talk about that. But let me exp explain what I mean. There's two basic components to fluency. The first is this thing called automaticity. That's your link to words up there. Automaticity refers to the ability to recognize words not just accurately. That's what we teach at the top part, the word study. We want automatic recognition. The theory of automaticity is, goes like this. David LeBird said, every human being every, on, on this planet, we've got this mental engine, it's our brain. Now this brain of ours, it can do great things, solve problems, be creative, make works of art, but there are certain limitations to what this brain of ours can do. One of the biggest is the ability to do multiple tasks simultaneously. Do you ever try to do two, three, four, five things at the same time that require your attention? Teachers, you're always trying to, you're gonna mess up on at least one. I usually mess up on all of them. It's hard to divide up our attention. And you see, that's the problem in reading. Reading is a multitask activity. I think we'd all agree there's at least two things any reader has to do. The first thing is the top thing, words. You've got to figure out the words. How do they sound and what they mean? The other thing, more importantly, is the bottom, uh, bottom part, their comprehension. What's the author telling you with the words? And here's the idea. Think of your brain as having a limited amount of mental energy up here. All of us, we're limited. If we have to use too much of this energy to figure out the words, even if we read the words correctly, you know what they mean. We get around that bottom part there, comprehension, guess what? We don't understand what we've read. It's not that we don't have the ability, it's that we used it all up decoding the words. You know these kids, when you read them, when you see them, when they read, they're slow, full of effort, letter by letter, sound by sound. I say, God bless these children for working so hard, but they're putting all their effort in the wrong area. What we want them to be is like us, automatic in our word recognition. When you and I read, how often do we have to stop and sound out a word? Think about the meaning of a word. One word out of a thousand, I would say even that's an overestimate. Probably one word out of every 10,000. 
Those are instant words, sight words, instantly recognized. And what that means is we can give minimal amount of our mental energy to the top part, word recognition. We can save that for the bottom part, comprehension. And how did we get that way? How did we develop this enormous sight vocabulary? Uh, what do we do? You practice. You practice something, it becomes second nature after a while. Think of all the things that are automatic at you know, driving a car or you know, jump, making a jump shot in basketball. I often use driving a car as an example of that. You know, it's a pretty automatic task, though. Well, maybe not here in the city because you really have to, <laughs> you've got to be really careful. But, you know, you get out into the country, it's a pretty automatic test. Foot on the brake, key ignition, you're off and running. But do you remember learning to drive? Not so automatic, was it? I remember sitting behind the wheel for the first time. Oh, my goodness, did I get scared. I'm thinking to myself, man, Rosinski, you better pay attention. You could hurt somebody. So what do you have to do? Focus, focus, focus. Turn off the radio. It's pulling away some of my mental energy. 99 degrees outside. We had no air conditioning in that 56 Ford, but I'm rolling up the window. Why? My friends are across the street making fun of me. There's Rosinski, the other way he's going to hit somebody. I don't need to hear that. And then there's my father sitting next to me singing. You are my sunshine. Dad, shut up, please. Come on. I had to focus. Now, with a little bit of practice, I, de I developed accuracy. Not accuracy in my word recognition. It was accuracy in my driving. I quit hitting the mailbox, running over the curb, hitting the fire hydrant. <laughs> a little bit more practice, I developed automaticity in my driving. How do I know? Did you ever drive someplace and don't know how you got there? It's scary. It's happening more and more. Just a couple of Saturdays ago, my wife sent me to the grocery store. Get orange juice and milk for breakfast, okay? So I jump in the car, and 20 minutes later, I'm pulling into the parking lot at work. Gee, I wonder why I know at work today. Oh, my God, it's Saturday, you know. Uh, but, you know, now we are so automatic at our driving, we can multitask. You can drive accurately, listen to the radio, talk on the, uh, can't, talk on the phone, converse with a passenger. Yeah, not here in New York. We're much more advanced in Ohio than you guys in there. <laughs> but, you know, you can do multiple things. Sir. I was watching a lady driving, putting on her makeup, and a guy shaving uh, uh, while driving. Uh, there. In reading, we want kids to be able to read the words and figure those out, but more importantly, pay attention to, to the meaning that the author is trying to convey. And you, you, you do that by automatizing the top there, and, you, and you, you, get auto, you develop automaticity through practice. Talk about that in a second here. But let's finish the bridge. There's a missing component in fluency, and that's this thing called prosody. Prosody is your connection to comprehension. Uh, uh, the better term and the more common term is expressiveness. If I think about somebody who's a fluent reader, it's not somebody who reads fast. It's somebody who uses their voice to make meaning. They get loud, they get soft, they get fast, they get slow. They have dramatic pauses. And in doing all these things, what they're doing is adding meaning to their text there. Just re um, the, our previous speaker here, I, I marveled at his use of expressiveness. And I wondered how, how, how perhaps less engaging it would have been had he read it as a lecture. You know, that his voice, his, his, his command of his words in that prosodic way added to our meaning and enjoyment of the presentation here. Here's a silly example of what I mean by the connection of meaning. A few years ago, there was this popular commercial, and I, I've seen it again. It's, I think it's coming back. It was a beer commercial. This young man, he's about 28 or so, he had these different experiences during this commercial. He had one word in response to each of these experiences, he said the word dude. It's called the dude commercial. You can find it on YouTube here. But every time he used it, it had a different meaning. He changed the meaning of the word. Let's try it here. Close your eyes. Channel that 28-year-old male inside of you. I know it's hard for some of you, but do the best you can. <laughs> now, turn the person next to you and say hello to them. Use the word dude. How would it sound? Dude, dude, right? All right, turn the person next to you and express consternation and disappointment. Use the word dude now. Dude. Ask a question. Use the word dude. Dude? You just won the New York State Lottery, 150 million bucks. Dude! All right, did the word change? Not a bit. Did the meaning? Yes. When we cross this bridge and make a pit stop at prosody, we're adding meaning. And I know that's a silly example, but let me share with you some research that was done by the U.S. Department of Education a few years ago. What they looked at was fourth graders. Fourth grade is where, uh, where you can get some really good data because the kids are more reliable in terms of their performance. They had these kids, fourth graders read a passage, a fourth grade passage, out loud in their best voice. They recorded the kids reading, and they brought folks in like us, teachers. We put on the headphones, we listened to kids read, and then we rated them on, on their fluency. It was a four-point scale. The very same kids were given a silent reading comprehension test. Some passages, read them silently, and at the end of each passage, there'll be some comprehension questions. Answer them. They'll give us an indication of how well you understand when you read silently. Now, what they try to do is connect the dots. Is there any relationship between oral prosody and silent reading? 
Here's what they found. Those kids that when they read orally, it sounded like real language. When they read silently, their standard score in the silent comprehension test was 249. Now, that doesn't mean too much. Let's, let me turn that into a grade equivalent score. It's approximately sixth grade. Fourth graders reading at a sixth grade level. Wouldn't you be happy with that? I certainly would. But how about those children who are only moderately fluent? You know, they they pretty good, but they messed up in a little places, you know, a couple places. Well, look what happened to their comprehension score it dropped. And then you have those students who are somewhat disfluent. They're more disfluent than they are fluent. So it's kind of staccato like reading and uh, stopping in inappropriate places. Their comprehension continues to drop. And then finally, we have what we call the robot readers. These are the kids, they get the words right, but they read like this slow. Or now it's they read as fast as they can, but it doesn't sound like real language. And look what happened there. That's a 30-point drop from the previous score. Second grade, little over second grade score. These are kids that we worry the most about. Uh, there. So there is this relationship. And we found a similar relationship at almost every grade level. We, not, not almost every grade level I have done this kind of study with. The way you sound when you read orally reflects the way you compre comprehend when you read silently. And so here's the logic behind fluency. We want to raise comprehension. Get that score going up. How do you do that? You work on all the stuff above the line. Word recognition, but also automaticity and also prosody. And what that ha what happens, what we find is comprehension going up. Sheila, now remember that, 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 that model I gave you, the stuff above the line, word recognition, vocabulary, fluency. There's a professor at the University of Washington on the West Coast, Sheila Valencia. She and her colleagues have been looking at students who do poorly on these state reading exams, silent reading comprehension tests. And she basically asked the question, where is the problem? And what she finds is that among these students who do so poorly, 75 to 90 percent of them, the problem seems to lie above that line. They have problems with word recognition, with vocabulary, with fluency, both automaticity and prosody. And as a result, that line that I showed you earlier is a barrier that keeps them from going deep. 75 to 90 percent of our kids. Imagine the impact we could have on our students' achievement if we could get our students to, to master that stuff above the line, those foundational skills there. So what I'd like to do then is, okay, we have to spend time every day teaching above the line. You know, how much time? That's debatable. But in the area of fluency, I would suggest, you know, at least 15 minutes, maybe 20. I know it's always hard to find time, but there are ways of weaving this into the curriculum. I created this thing called MAP, M-A-P. That's it in a nutshell. Model fluent reading, engage in assisted reading, and then practice reading uh, there. Now, modeling, that's the easy part. That's, that means read to your students. We know that students who are read to on a regular basis, you know, they have larger vocabularies, they have better comprehension skills, uh, they're more enthusiastic about reading. Uh, but also, it gives you an opportunity to model fl fluency. First day of school, get out a book and say, class, have I got a great story for you. Sylvester and the Magic Pebble by William Steig, wonderful author. And read it with expression. And when you're done, talk about it. Talk about not only the content, but how you read it. Did you notice how I changed my voice when I became a different character? Did you notice this long pause? What were you thinking? Help kids notice that you were using their vo your voice to improve their understanding and their enjoyment of the text. The next day, though, start off all again with another story, William Steig or whatever, and say, oh, have I got another great story, but this time read it slightly differently. Read the words correctly, but read them like a robot. Sylvester Duncan lived on Acorn Road with his mother and father. And they're looking at you funny. You say, well, I got all the words right. Isn't that good enough? Oh, I must not be reading fast enough. And so take the next two lines and read it a million miles an hour. You're going to get the same looks. But the idea is that if I read this way and you don't enjoy or understand uh, what I read... How can you understand yourself when you read that way? You see, we have children who define fluency as reading as fast as you can. And it's not that. It's reading with expression. And so we call that meta developing this metacognitive awareness, where they become aware of the fact that they have to read with expression. They have to read with uh, appropriate pacing and so on. So the modeling is essential. That introduces our kids to where they need to go. They need to read with expression. But then let's move on to assisted reading. Assist, I use a little metaphor for assisted reading. Basically, it's if I can't read something by myself, I can read it with another person. My, my, my analogy is learning to ride a bicycle. 
When I was four or five or so, I got a two-wheeler for my birthday, and it didn't have training wheels on it. It was the neighbors, and they gave it to my dad who got it cleaned up and gave it to me. Um, and I had, I had the hardest time learning to this because I didn't have the training. I just couldn't get the hang of it. Finally, one day, my dad came home from work. He worked in a factory, and he said, hey, Timmy, I'll help you. You get on the bike, you put your feet on the pedals and your hands on the handlebar. I'm going to hold the, the seat. And I'm going to run right next to you as you ride your bike here. And that's what happened. So he's holding me up. And we go around the, around the yard a couple of times. And, well, finally, I could hear my dad huffing and puffing. And he, he said, OK, kid, you're on your own. He gave me a push. I'm getting a beer. And uh, <laughs> you know what? I didn't need his help anymore. I, you know, all I needed was a little bit of his holding me up till I got, found my sea legs or my bike legs. And then I was on my own there. Well, it's the same thing with reading, assisted reading. If I can't read on my own, I can read it with another person. Now, how does that look? Well, choral reading. Read as a group, right? A daily text, a daily poem, or a daily song. Let's read it together. If I'm not a good reader, you guys are. And by the time we read it three or four times, I won't need your help uh, uh, there. Paired reading is, uh, uh, is just two, you know, two, two, auth two readers uh, reading together. This time it's uh, uh, a good reader and a not-so-good reader. And for 10 minutes a day. Keith Topping's worth on paired reading is, is, is stunning. He's an English uh, psychologist, and he developed as a parent involvement program. He has parents to work with their children 10 minutes a day, sit side by side, and read with your child. Don't alternate lines. Read together, out loud together. Give your child a chance to control. They get to choose what to read, and they also get to choose when they want to solo. A little elbow or signal in the ribs is signal to dad to mom, be quiet. Let me try on my own. If the child starts having difficulty, the parent jumps right back in. What Keith found was he would be working with kids who would say would be making a half month's progress for every month's worth of school. You know, they are making progress, but not nearly as much as they need to. If they started to do this 10 minutes a day with their parents, lo and behold, these kids are now making a month and a half of progress. Not just in fluency, comprehension, silent reading comprehension. Three times the progress they were previously making. Well, paired reading could be teachers, it could be aides, it could be other children, as long as there's a good reader and a not-so-good reader sitting side by side. And interestingly enough, even the good reader seems to benefit from that sort of activity there. And then we have audio-assisted reading. Well, if you don't have somebody who can read with you, well, then technology. Uh, there, our previous speaker was talking about the use of technology here. Here's a study that was done by a, uh, a uh, Merlin Pluck, a... Uh, reading recovery trained teacher in New Zealand. She was assigned as an intervention teacher, but she had several schools to work at. And, you know, that, that meant she had one day per week at every school. And, and, you know, these children, they need your help every single day if you're an intervention teacher, at least three or four days a week. And she got a year of, you know, very frustrating year. The following summer, she got a, a, a small grant. And what she did was she took books that were common in every one of her buildings and, you know, created a listening library. She would take them, sit on her patio, read the books, you know, put in the, all the bells and whistles, when to turn the page. And then she would make copies of cassette tapes, five for, one for each school. So the students, the idea was the kids would go down to this listening center 15, 20, 25 minutes per day, uh, put on the headphones, choose a book, read and listen until you could read the book on your own without the help of the tape. Now, oops, there we go. Ostensibly, 27-week study, right? Uh, there, thank you. Uh, that's three quarters of a year. So ostensibly, we should expect three quarters of a year gain. The actual gain was over two years' growth among these students. Some kids as much as four, uh, four years and some less. But, you know, there's something incredibly powerful about this idea of reading and listening. And here's, the, here's you know, if you don't have time for this, how about this one here, caption television. Finland has the high, or up until this past year, for about 20 years in a row, they had the highest level of literacy achievement among their elementary grade kids. Now, one of the reasons, according to Jim Trulis in his book, The Read Aloud Handbook, is because every television program in Finland is captioned. Uh, you're seeing the words, you're hearing the words. It's not the best reading in the world, but it is reading, right? And there have been some studies here in the United States that have seen that. What a simple thing to tell parents. You know, turn on a captioning switch and don't let the children turn it off. Leave it on. Do any of you watch caption TV? You know, I, I have a mild hearing loss. My wife says it's selective. It's another story. <laughs> but about two or three years ago, I, saw, I started, you know, it's sort of a, a, an adaptive technology for me. So I start turning, and I got hooked on it. 
I got hooked on it. And, and I, you know, I go to a hotel room. First thing you do is flip it on uh, uh, there. And I still remember when my I have four, four kids, four adult kids. Well, they're adults most of the time. Uh, but when they first came over home for the holidays, they hated it. Dad, turn that off. We can't see the picture, the whole picture. I said, no, this is my house. I want it on. You know, <laughs> when I leave the room, you can turn it off. But I want it on. And what I told my four adult kids is, I don't care if you read or not. Ignore the words. And you know what they said? We can't help ourselves. <laughs> Psychologists have a name for this. They call it an obligatory process, which means try as hard as you like. You're going to have a hard time keeping your eyes off the words. If you've never done it before, get a Netflix movie. Turn on the uh, captioning feature there. It's going to annoy you for about five minutes, and before you know it, you don't even know you're reading, but you are. And you're very, this is a very assistive way. Here's an interesting study I just found. It comes from the What Works Clearinghouse folks down U.S. Department of Education. What Works Clearinghouse review of the report of same language subtitling using subtitled music videos for reading. What a title. Karaoke reading. That's what it is. This was a study in Hawaii with high school students. These, what they did was they took songs that kid, these students already knew by heart, and then they put you know, the text in front of them. So they, again, they were, they were matching the, the, the song they had memorized with the, the words they were saying. What they found was pretty stunning. Teachers in this intervention condition use this caption television or karaoke to encourage reading proficiency over 12 weeks. If you can get an effect in 12 weeks, you got something there. Students in this, inter, uh, uh, they would do this 15, 20 minutes a day. Uh, there. What they did was they calculated the difference, and they found that kids who were, students who were in this condition made significantly higher growth, not only in fluency, but also reading comprehension over students who were in a business as usual uh, condition. Sometimes we've got to think outside the box, you know, about way, you know, making these kinds of things happen here. Well, let's finally talk about practice. Practice, you know, if you talk about practice and reading, there's actually two kinds of practice. Wide reading. That's the most common form of practice. That's the kind of reading you folks have been doing myself during vacation, right? You read a book, and when you're done reading a book, you move on to the next book. Or after you read the front page of the newspaper, you go to the sports page or the community section. Well, that's wide reading. Our students read a story or a chapter. When they're done, we talk about it. We do some extension activities. Move on, move on to the next story. But I'd like for you to think about the students of yours who are not the good readers. They read a story once they don't read it very well. They know it and you know it. But we have to move on because the principal said we have to finish this book by the end of the school year. So you move on to the next story. Well, it's not one, you know, it's one mediocre reading after another. I submit to you, if all you practice is mediocre reading with your kids, don't be surprised if you end up with mediocre results when you end up taking that end of the year test there. I think sometimes you have to say to our students, guys, we didn't read that very well. We need to read it again, and maybe even again and again and again until we can read it well, or at least a portion of that. Now, I have come to call that deep reading. I like that idea of wide and deep. The Hudson River is wide, it's also deep. The technical term is repeated reading, the common core call it close reading. That's where you read something closely several times through. The guy who actually coined the term, I mentioned him at the beginning of my session, Dr. J. Samuels at the University of Minnesota. Uh, there, he was working with some, some kids well, he had run and ran a reading clinic and was doing, you know, wide reading. I mean, this typically, this happens to all of us, doesn't it? Where students, some students, they'll read story eight. And as you can see with that flat line, they read it once and they didn't make much progress. But we moved on. They move on to passage two and still not much progress. And passage three, still not much. You know, these are the, you know, not, ideally, we would like to see growth, but that's not happening very much. How about if we tried it this way? We take passage A. And we read it once, twice, three, four times. And as you can see on my line here, there's improvement. Word recognition, fluency, comprehension. But you'd expect that. When you practice something, you are going to get better at it. It's what happens next. How about it then if we move on to passage B? B is harder than A. Let's see what happens there. Notice that the first, line, first reading of B is better than the first reading of A, even though B is harder than A. All, the, the only thing they did between the first reading of A and the first reading of B was they practiced A. So the only thing you can attribute this growth over here uh, and B was this practice in A. What were they learning by practicing A? They went over to B. Side vocabulary, sense of uh, prosody. Uh, how about confidence? I think that's, that's the big one. When you get third, fourth graders whose growth in reading looks like a flat line, they give up. They just don't think they can do it anymore. All right? How many of us as, adult, as adults do things we're not very good at? We tend to avoid those. You do that in reading, though, of course, you're pretty much guaranteed yourself failure. 
Well, to make a long, long story short, we go on to C, D, E, and F. And every, every new passage is a little bit more challenging than the one before. And what you see is growth. What you see is growth uh, uh, there. There have, been, there have been over 100 studies on repeated reading. I, I wrote the, reading, uh, the fluency chapter for the Handbook of Reading Research. And I can tell you that I didn't find one study that disputed these findings. When kids practice something repeatedly, you see this kind of growth. But the question becomes, you know, we, we know that repeated readings, if you have a fluency program in your school, it's all based upon repeated readings. But how do you actually get kids in this sort of thing to do it? Uh, there, What would motivate students to do it, to read something repeatedly? You know what it is now? It's to read it fast. Read this four times until you read 120 words per minute, then we're going to move on to the next passage. That's a lot of these fluency programs. That's what the, the message they get. Where in real life does that happen? Where you read something for the purpose of speeding through it? The only thing I can think of is those drug commercials where at the end they tell you what's going to kill you. Uh, <laughs> Give me a real reason. See, here's the way I like to put it. What I just shared with you is science. You know, that teaching reading is a science. That's a, but you know why teaching is such a hard thing? It's not just a science. You guys are scientists for sure, but you're also an artist. And that's the part we need to, to think about. What would be a real, authentic reason for make us want to read something several times through? And I think a more authentic reason than speed is performance. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna perform something for an audience, you're going to practice or rehearse it. And the rehearsal isn't aimed at going fast, it's at me making meaning. This very talk I'm giving right now, I spent an hour and a half last night looking it over. I spent an hour this morning in the hotel room looking it over. And when I came here, I was sitting back there listening to the previous speaker. And I was listening, but I was also flipping through my notes. And the reason, I want to do a good job. I hope you can leave here this, this morning saying, well, gee, he reminds me of some of those things maybe I'll bring back into my classroom. Or I understand this fluency thing. Or you might just say, you know, uh, you know we had some stupid jokes, but we're going to forgive him anyways. If there's any degree of satisfaction that comes from my presentation to you, that practice was worth every bit of it. Well, that leads me to the next question. Are there texts that are meant to be performed read out loud? How about informational text? Wouldn't be my first choice. Did you ever try performing evaporation for an audience or igneous? Or... Those, they're hard to read with expression, and that's the challenge. I'm not saying they're not important. They are. But here's what I come up with. Poetry, reader's theater, song lyrics, dialogues, monologues, speeches, the Gettysburg Address we were doing last November with our students, Dr. King's I, uh, I Have a Dream speech, but also his letter from a Birmingham jail we were doing back in January. These are the kinds of material that you want kids to practice, 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 and perform. Poetry especially, because of that nature. It's short, it's rhythmical, it's easy to learn, and it reflects who we are as, as, as Americans. Uh, uh, there with our older kids, we do a whole week of uh, Emily Dickinson's poems, and we do a whole week of Langston Hughes' poems, a whole week of Carl Sandburg, and really get into depth in that kind of text there. Well, I ended up writing about this as well. Why poetry? We need to bring poetry and song back into the classroom for all those different reasons. I'll make sure I get this out to you guys as well. But I call that, I call that um, the, artful, the artful side of teaching reading. It's not just a science, it's an art. That's why teaching is such a challenge for all of us, so, such hard work here. Well, let's finish up putting it all together. I've got a few more minutes, right, Alex, there? I, what would happen if you took those top three, modeling, assisted reading, and practice, and putting it all together? Then you got synergy. Synergy. Synergy, synergistic fluency instruction. That's what I'd like to end uh, the, the evening with, or the morning with here. Synergy means to put it together. When you analyze something, you break it up into parts. When you synthesize, you put it back together. And the idea is if we could create a lesson that combines these elements, you get something that's greater than the sum of the parts. So I'm going to share with you this fluency development lesson. Uh, there, it's our core lesson in our reading clinic at our university. We, our students, we find fluency is a huge issue with them. We, we, they get this lesson every single day. Here's how it works. This is something you might want to consider for your own, in your own classroom if you can find 15, 20 minutes or if you are an intervention teacher. The purpose of the FDL, that's what I call it, fluency development lesson. By the way, I see all of you guys writing notes here. If you would like my PowerPoint, I'm happy to send it to you. At the, end, at the end, I'll give you my email address. Just jot it down. But uh, go, take notes anyways. It makes me look like you're listening. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm happy, I'm happy to share it with you guys uh, there. The purpose is for students to learn to read something well. Uh, get, develop that sense of confidence, accomplishment. 
that I think our students, we all need to feel that sense of accomplishment every single day. So here's how it goes. You need a daily text uh, there. So in 15 to 20 minutes. Now that text, it could be pretty much anything, but I like poetry and song, but it could be a segment of a story uh, there. You make two copies of that, of that text. So let's say it was Flag Day, June 14th. We were doing this. So we had our, our students read you're right, the George M. Cohan song. You're a grand old flag. You're a high-flying flag. And forever in peace may you wave. All right. So everybody gets two copies of that. You guys are first, second graders here. And we start with me modeling this text. So I'll sing it to you once. I'll read it to you once. I might read it not very fluently. When we're done with that, you know, we'll talk about it. Uh, we'll, t we'll talk about, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but after I model it, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about how, which one of my readings you like the best. Might give you some background to Old Glory. Might talk about Mr. George M. Cohan, whose statue is in Times Square, uh, one of the first great impresarios in the musical theater. Having done that, then we do the assisted reading. Okay, everybody, let's read together. Once, twice, three times. First together, then the boys, then the girls, alternate lines, you know, create some variety. Then we move on. Okay, everybody find a partner. I'd like for you to practice this uh, two more times. Student A to student B, student B to student A. Whoever is the listener, your job is to follow along and help your partner if they have any difficulty and tell your partner what they liked about their, re your, uh, about your, uh, what they liked about their partner's reading. And, and then reverse roles. Now, we've just read this text you know, anywhere from 6 to 16 times. The number of repetitions depends upon the complexity of the text here. But to get students to do this repetition or this rehearsal, they need to be performing. Okay, who wants to perform? Grand old flag. And every hand will go up because kids can do it pretty well. And that's where teachers, we start doing this, were incredibly creative. They would send four kids down to Mrs. Smith's room to perform for them. Five kids, you guys go to Mr. the principal's office and perform for the principal and secretary. There's sometimes there's a parent sitting outside the hallway, and the kid children perform for the parent. It could be an audience of one. All they need is somebody to listen to them and say, oh, my goodness, was that good, you know, and, and do it again uh, one more time. In our reading clinic, that's my favorite time because I'm the person walking up and down the hallway, uh, and kids get sent out, and I'll, I can make a big fuss about their reading and how good it was uh, uh, there. Now, we know in many cases children will know that, that poem or song by heart after a five or six reading, so we want to do a little bit of word study. Uh, there we will we call it harvesting words. So from that song or poem, the children will call out five or six interesting words. We'll put them on the word wall, and we'll make a word ladder. We'll do word bingo. Uh, look at word families, whatever. There, uh, grand old flag. We came up with grand acquaintance, boast and brag, and emblem. I believe were the words that we harvested, and then we did some things, uh, some studies with that. Now remember, I gave you two copies of this poem. One copy goes in your poetry folder, and every Friday we're going to have a poetry slam. All our students, make sure you come to school on Friday dressed in black, clicking your fingers, saying carpe diem to each other. Uh, uh, there. The other one goes home. It may never, ever come back. But the idea is for take it home and read to your parents or anybody in your family that you would like. You know, as much as we would like our parents to read to their ch our children, that's probably the best thing they could do. The fact of the matter is some parents just can't or won't. Uh, uh, they're, maybe they're holding down three jobs. Maybe they had difficulty in reading. Maybe they had poor experiences themselves in school. And I can understand that. But you know what anybody can do? Anybody can listen. There have been some research out of England that talks about listening. Parents trained to listen to their children in a positive way. And the impact, the positive impact it has simply by being a good listener. And I know it sounds easy. You know, what do you mean? Uh, uh, you got to train parents? To, yeah. I remember listening to my my kids read, and I'll tell you, I could never get the teacher out of me. I had to turn everything into a lesson. They don't need that from me. They need positive reinforcement. Uh, there. But, so go home, read it to mom, read it to dad, call up grandma, read it to her, read it to the dog, read it to your siblings. That evolved into a lucky listener club. Whoever listens to you read your poem, they sign the back of the sheet, back of the sheet with a comment or two. And if dad heard you three times, he signs three times. Mom heard you four times, she signs four times. The kids come back to school the next day, you know, uh, who has the most signatures? They get to be the word wizard for that day or some special ta uh, job there. Uh, and some kids get into it, some kids don't. But, you know, the idea, we have to cast a wide net. Now, the next day, we do it all over again, except we read yesterday's poem one more time. And then, you know, the next, we did a whole week of George M. Cohan songs, by the, by the, by the way. Uh, give my regards to Broadway. That was the next day. Then, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. And then we had... Uh, oh, I forget the other ones there, but you got the idea there. Well, 
Does it work? Does it work? This lesson done on a regular basis, at least three days a week. Well, I could give you my own research, but sometimes people say, well, you're biased, you know. Okay, well, we had some visitors from, at our reading clinic and by the way, we have an open invitation for visitors to come to our reading cl clinic. So all you have to do is get on I-80 uh, <laughs> and, and go about 441 miles. And there's a sign that says Kent State University. You're there. Uh, there. But we had some from, from Monroe County, uh, uh, Indiana. Now, now, Indiana started something a couple years ago where every third grader is tested at the end of the school year, well, April or May, cycling like comprehension test. And if these children, the children who don't pass are given the opportunity to go to a summer school program, and at the end of that, they're tested again. And the, the, theoretically, if they don't pass, they're supposed to be retained. Well, we had visitors at our reading clinic from Monroe County, the Bloomington, Indiana area, and um, they decided to do this lesson for their summer intervention program. Uh, uh, there. Every day, the kids would actually go through this process of learning to read this text very well. Uh, here's what happened. Here's what the report. I could give you all the details, but here's the essence of it. Following the summer camp poetry reading program and the second round of tests, 93% of the Monroe County School Corporation passed the I read. That's the test. I read three. 93, one of the highest levels of performance in the entire state of Indiana. What did they do? You worked on fluency. We improved comprehension. We crossed that bridge to the promised land. Other studies. Lorraine Griffith with her fourth graders found even fourth graders issue uh, very similar. Notice that her kids gain are struggling readers over two years' growth uh, for the one year they're in her class. Normally, we expect kids to gain about 25 words per minute from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Her kids gain close to 60 words per minute, even though she never says, let's try to read fast today. You don't have to. They got fast the way everybody in this room became fast, which is really what? We just practiced light, right? Well, Rhonda Powell is another uh, teacher. I shouldn't have given her last name, but um, sixth grade. She teaches in South Carolina. Take a look at, uh, I was giving a talk once, and she, and she was doing this uh, weekly, uh, you know, th this lesson where the kids would practice poetry every, day, every single day. At the beginning of the school year, notice what happened here. Two-thirds of her kids were below basic on the previous year's state reading exam, and she had none that were advanced. So every day they would practice poetry and perform it. But it was about half the period. She found that fluency was an issue even with these sixth graders. Look what happened in, in this school year. By the end of the school year, the below basic kids went from two-thirds to 24%. But look at the other end, where there, she only had 3% of her kids advanced or proficient. Now it's 30% uh, there. Again, this is working not only for those lower achievers, even the higher achievers as well. There's a whole series of studies, and I'll be happy to share them with you if you'd like. But more and more, we're realizing how important this is here. The takeaway, fluency should be hot. Not because it leads to fast readers, but because it leads to confident readers who comprehend, cross that bridge. This is the book that I wrote that Scholastic has, and if you're interested, I'll, I'll be up there with it. But I, I'd like to end uh, with, uh, with a poem. Since we started with a song, i end with a poem. Um, one that my mother sent me. You know, when I got out of the service and, and became a teacher, I'll tell you, my first year was a disaster. I was a third grade teacher, and... You know, I thought, man, I'm a big guy. I'll scare these kids to death, you know. It didn't work that way. It was the other way around. And I remember <laughs> writing to my mother saying, I, you know, I feel sorry for these kids, you know, after all this, what, what happened to them. I wrote to my mom, though, at the time, and I said, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this, you know. And she said, you, you know, hang in there, you know. This happens to a lot of people. You're a good person. You, you do well with kids. It'll, things will get better. Inside, in, in, this, in this envelope, though, she sent to me, was included a poem that I'd like to wish for you. It's my wish for you as we begin this great school year. I can't think of a better profession, a more important profession than that of educator. Thanks. It's a poem that many of you know. It's by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, or it's at least attributed to him. It's called Success. And what is, uh, this, is, this is it. Success. <clears throat> to laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children to earn the appreciation of honest critics, and to endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, a redeemed social condition, to know that even one life, one single life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. And then my mom wrote it at the bottom of the poem, Tim, this is to have been a teacher. Thank you all for being teachers. Thanks for all you do.
If we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Uh, anyone? Yes. Every day was a different poem. You know, it's basically taking that idea that many teachers do where you practice a poem over the course of the week, but we squash it into one day because you want greater intensity. So it's nothing new, but it's just kind of a different take on it. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, how would you handle, um, in terms of uh, delivery and content, a classroom that has such varying degrees of fluency? Well, here's the deal about that. that the question was uh, content. No, number one, when you, um, how should, number one, I would go for the more challenging pieces. Uh, Steve Stahl's research says that um, the kids make the greatest progress when the stuff, when the material they're asked to practice is slightly more difficult than they would normally read. There, so aim for the little higher, uh, higher level. And it would just be to me, it's the number of practices, the, the number of routines that you have to go through. If you're a more advanced kids, maybe you don't have to practice as much. The more, the less advanced kids need to practice. The goal is to end the day with that ability to read something well. And even at the end of that day, some kids are still going to be able to read it better than the others, but it's the practice that, uh, that gets it. I could read, you know, how about if I gave you Jabberwocky today? It's a challenging text, right? But if you practiced it over the course of, I, I know it by heart, so I don't need to practice as, as much, but I like reading because it's fun. But somebody else might have to practice a little bit more than I do because you're not as familiar with it. In, in both cases, we, we, we have a natural, authentic uh, uh, um, reason to do this kind of practice. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question uh, uh, the, uh, to, your, to your liking, but the key is to give the kids something that, that they would uh, pr find not easy to begin with, something that's a little bit more challenging, and that, that, would, would be, that would cover a lot of different ground there. Yes? Well, both. I mean, think about all the poetry out there that you can connect you to the curricul curriculum. We're still studying the, the Civil War. I bring in the poetry of Walt Whitman, uh, that O Captain, My Captain. Uh, on uh, uh, Veterans Day, bring in In Flanders, Filled with the Poppies Blow, Beneath the Crosses, Row on Row. Think of all the po poets out there. You know, they'll do a whole week of, you know, the, uh, I mentioned Langston Hughes, poet of the Harlem Renaissance, the wonderful metaphors that he creates that can be there. I, so I, I like choosing material and trying to t tie it into what we're actually doing there. So you could really go anyway, any direction you want to, whatever seems to be m most pleasing for you uh, there. The whole idea with reading aloud, I think, has a, a tremendous amount of, of application. Uh, I've done it in middle school, but I also teach a, a college freshman writing course. And I read as often as I can to those students. Yeah. Uh, we have just about every culture represented. And the pride that they have when they read yep. their own piece or they give me their piece to read so they can hear it, yep. I can see improvements in their not only reading, but their writing as the well. Statue. Oh. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen, I have videos of kids, you know, start to your head down, mumble reading. By the end of the year, they're standing straight and tall, you know, because it is an accomplishment that you can do. It is. Ruth Colum is going to be here in a couple of days, and she can talk about the six traits. One of her six traits is voice, voice and writing. You know how you learn to write, my, you know how you develop voice? You have to learn to read with voice first. And then you, that voice turns on when you start writing. So, you know, the, the connection is pretty amazing. Thanks for your comment. That's great.